So I um, just wanted to say a warm welcome to everyone who's watching this right now, be it in the Zoom meeting or on Facebook Live. It's so wonderful that you could all be here. And yes, I know that performing on Zoom and online is, um, is a different experience to performing live, but we make these moments because they're few and far between and we just embrace culture as and, as and when we can get it. And I hope everyone has a great experience and, um, you know, enjoys themselves tonight because that's what it's all about is to bring some culture connection making friends getting to know other people um and sharing your artistry with the world which is you know which is amazing so i'm really looking forward to everyone's performances um i'm just gonna oh i need to um say that if anyone uh has anything that could potentially be triggering uh please just give everyone a heads up before you go before you say your thing because um sometimes like we're not sure how people are going to react and it's always best to just sort of let people know if there's anything of a very kind of like you know well yeah you know what i mean anyway so um if anyone hasn't uh checked out our youtube site we're actually trying to get 100 subscribers because that will mean that we can have a short url for our wonder zoo site so if anyone um can do us a favor and subscribe to our YouTube channel at some point. Just remember that because we really need the help. Uh, we also have an anthology out at the moment, which I don't know if, uh, if you follow our web, uh, our Facebook page, we've got it on there. And it's the thing that we do regularly for anyone who's interested, you can submit work and have it on the, in the online anthology. So yeah, with Wonder Zoo, we're always sort of like trying to provide platforms in lots of different ways for the arts. And um, we want everyone to get involved. So um yeah so i think i will now go into announcing our first performer who is the wonderful philippa ankla uden um philippa is someone that we recently met um it was at a black lives matter celebration with the plymouth and Ra plymouth and devon racial equality council and it was where a lot of people just gathered online to celebrate the not black lives matter sorry black history month um, and that's where we met Philippa and she, um, she's uh, just finished her degree in English and Drama at Exeter University and she's got a first and now um, she's ready to take on the world with her amazing mind and, um, <laughs> and she's a poet as well as she's really passionate about uh, racial equality and helping to make the world a better place. Um, so hi Philippa. I'll, I'll, I'll now hand over to you, so it's all yours. Amazing. Um, thank you so much for having me. If any, if everyone could just turn their, um, put, turn themselves onto mute so that there's no kind of background noise whilst the performers are on. Great. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Just, um, yeah, let me know any way through it in case, um, in case there's any tech issues or anything and I'll try to be as patient as possible with it. Um, Zoom's not been my friend recently. Um, okay, hello. Um, so my name is Pip. Um, but yeah, you can call me Pip for short. Um, obviously, my full name's Philippa. Um, I'm 21 and I recently graduated from Exeter University. Um, and I'm passionate about a lot of things, um, including racial equality, like she said. Um, also, um, social mobility. And um, for my dissertation, I wrote a collection of poems about um, discrimination against women of colour in the UK um, and how it manifests itself in different ways. And I wrote um, I wrote in the medium of poetry. Um, so I'd like to share a couple of these works um, and also like a few more just like lighthearted bits that I've been writing for my Instagram in between just to break it up. So, OK, I will start with um, my first poem, which is called A Kind of Sort of Brown. She's sort of brown, but not quite brown. She has a lovely accent brown. She looks Spanish until she speaks kind of brown, but I'm not sure where she's from kind of brown. She's friendly brown, an eloquent brown. She has a bright future kind of brown. She's light enough to save a brown, a gently toasted golden brown. She's quirky brown, a beautiful brown. A she looks stunning in everything brown. A sensible brown, but confident brown. I've checked her off my bucket list brown. She's got her life together, brown. Severely depressed, but smiling, brown. She's grateful for what she gets, kind of brown. She just won't shut up about racism, brown. Thank you. So, 
that is my first one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, I've just got, I've got them all on tabs um, because I've been editing them recently. So um, <laughs> Uh, thank you for your patience as I sort of shuffle these around. Okay, so this next one um, is about uh, the media and the treatment of women of colour in the press. Um, I think the treatment of women in the press in general is uh, quite appalling. And there's like another added layer um, for women who aren't white. So this poem is based on, and it's sort of developed from a poem called The Alice Case by Joanne Lindbergh. And this poem was really inspiring to me um, as it talked about Alice as uh, rewritten as an autistic person and how um, Humpty Dumpty and the Caterpillar are basically saying all these awful things about her um, that actually just highlight those are just that's just how her brain works as autistic. And it's not really sort of fair to categorize those as bad, as bad qualities when she just thinks differently. Um, but the format is something that really inspired me. And this is how I wrote um, my poem, which is called Hounded. The problem with Megan, says the old friend, is that she's a social climber. Yes, says the paparazzi, and how much she loves the cameras. Indeed, says the actor, and that she called us racist. Yes, says the taxpayer, and she loves to splurge our hard-earned cash. And then, says the royalist, there's the rudeness to the queen. Alongside, says the interviewer, how she's got poor Harry on a lead. As well as, says the news agent, how she knew what she was in for. Of course, says the TV presenter, and she can't stop talking about herself. Not forgetting, says the journalist, that her magazine cover kicked up a stink. Or her failure, says the politician, to keep a stiff upper lip. Or her lack, says the royal expert, of any grace in her behaviour. Or her inability, says someone on the internet, to adapt to the royal ways. Excuse me, says the Duchess of Sussex, which one of you compared my son to a chimp? How dare you accuse us of such a thing, says the press. Let's hear what the public has to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll drop a lighthearted one in here now. Um, and if this is just a super short one that I wrote for my Instagram um, a month or so ago. And um, obviously with everybody being indoors during uh, the pandemic, I would normally each year for Halloween, I get dressed, I'd spend like three hours getting dressed, um, putting on like a pair of wings or doing some really elaborate eye makeup to basically just go out to the club and sweat it all off. Um, so this poem is called This Halloween. This Halloween, I dressed as a mess. I bought some pajamas and crawled into bed. I saw my friend's costumes and makeup online and felt relaxed about my own time. For once, I felt no guilt or doubt that I was behind or I was missing out. Thank you. Yeah, super short one. I kind of like writing short ones for my Instagram because, um, well, not only is the square really small, but it's nice to sort of just digest a small piece of information because um, social media can be quite overwhelming. Um, so this is a piece of, how long I've got left? I've got about, I assume I've got about five minutes left? Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Yeah, great, thanks, thanks, Chi. Okay, so um, this poem was written after a poet called Chelsea Kareen. Um, where she wrote a poem called The Patron Saint of Girls at Homecoming. So um, to take after Chelsea Corain, I've written uh, The Patron Saint of British Women of Colour. She knocks back a pint of Cornish Orchard, like she is crushing the apples in her mouth, the fizz ready to erupt from the depths of her belly, a rebellion of a burp. The gravy on her plate steams like dwindling coal, a dressing of molten lava over slices of lamb and parsnip. It melts around the knife and on her gums. The mint sauce kicks the corners of her brain into action. She tears the Yorkshire pudding and wipes the plate with it. A delicious soggy flannel on her tongue, her drugstore scarlet shade bleeding from her lips. She smudges it into war paint with a napkin and she asks for seconds. Thank you. 
<laughs> oh, thank you so much, Pip. Sorry, I've, I introduced you as Philippa because you prefer yeah, Pip. No worries. <laughs> that was so cool. This was um, Pip's debut performance at Wonder Zoo, and I think it's great to have someone new who's, you know, who, to come into the fold <laughs> and, and be <laughs> thank part. Thank you for of having me. That's really, it's really lovely to see like someone new, and yeah, great to hear all your stuff. Really enjoyed it. Um, has anyone got anything that I'd like to say? If you can unmute yourselves and if you want to talk to Pip and say anything, feel free, please do. Or and, any comments coming through on the Facebook? I need to actually check that in a minute. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. No comments coming through. Ah, me. I really like the Megan one. Yeah. I really like it. Thank I wanted you. it to like go on. I just yeah. <laughs> I, I like her defended anyway. Forever, really. But um, but yeah, I, you could have just carried on because I just love her <laughs> and I love the way you put it together and I like it backs her corner without really stating your stance at all. Um it's clever, it's really lovely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Poppy. You're welcome. Yeah, it, I really like the um the brown. The brown skin one like how yeah that kind of yeah I can relate <laughs> yeah I think it's that idea of um sort of like what people perceive as, as somebody who's like diverse but also really palatable and acceptable in sort of like the eyes of um yeah yeah the eyes of the system if that makes sense so like somebody like me I'm more likely um to be able to access spaces that a darker skinned woman wouldn't yeah. But then um, when I do talk about these topics and I sort of like draw attention to the fact that like about maybe my mom's experiences as a first generation immigrant, that all of a sudden people don't like it. And it's like, oh, you, you're looking into it too much. You need to um, you need to keep your head down and things like that. And all of a sudden, like they see my skin color. Um, but yeah, so it's really it's a really weird dichotomy to be sort of tugged in between as a mixed race person. Yeah, yeah. Can I just say that was really fabulous, and I'd just like you to introduce you to me and Chi as the dolls. Do you see us? Us, oh, us as the dolls. Yeah, the moment, <laughs> my computer like just seems to be. I think my Zoom seems to be playing up at the moment, so I think I might have to um, take the video. My screen is just completely covered right now with something, and I don't know what it is. Okay, oh. no worries. I think but, I might have to dip out and hop back in. And yeah, yeah. Okay. You can always go on the Facebook live stream. Yeah, I'll hop on there. Great. Yeah, yeah. cool. Oh, thank you, Pip. So next up, we've got Kerry Baker. Hi, Kerry. Hi. Hi, I'm really sorry that it's so dark. That's all right. It's lovely to see you. I was fiddling around with my lamp and uh, before we started and I smashed it. <laughs> And then the main light's just too much. That's way too much. So, um, uh, Harry, whereabouts are you based? Because I know that you go to Tim King's um, open mic Monday morning sessions. Yeah, so I'm based in Ashburton. Hmm? Whereabouts do you live? I'm in Ashburton. Okay, it's not far then. Yeah. yeah cool. not far. So, yeah, so um, I met Slane at the open mic there and the online one that's been carrying on, which has been amazing. So um, yeah, I'm really, really grateful for being here. This is super exciting. Um, mm. So I started writing a couple of years ago when I was in a bit of a health crisis. And I use, I've always written, but I use writing to kind of, um, I guess, therap therapize myself. Mm. Yeah, so it was kind of a way of kind of processing everything that was happening. And then, um, I went to an open mic about a year ago, my first open mic, did a couple, and then we've been in lockdown ever since. So I've been writing relentlessly, using it as a kind of form of, a form of therapy. And I've kind of realized that actually that's that's the best use of it at the moment. So, mm. so what I've got is I've got a little set. I've tried to kind of get a bit of a kind of um, a breaking point um, piece, which I know that James and um, Slane have heard before um and this is this start this is kind of the point where we all maybe get to at some points in our lives where we just have to fuck it we just have to let go it's very sweary i'm just going to warn you that's my trigger warning um uh, but i think sweary in a completely acceptable way 
Um, and I wrote this after um, I'd been to a bookshop with my husband and I'd bought a book uh, called Fuck It, The Spiritual Guide. And my husband had bought um, uh, It's All, Everything's Fucked or something like that. And we realized that we were both kind of at this place in lockdown of going, okay, right, okay, this is happening. So this is it. It's called She Sings a Sweet Fuck It. She had given a lot of fucks. Many of the right kind, many not. Planted with hope for prosperity, some watered with naivety, some with anxiety. Unconscious roots suffer in darkness. Confused by a lack of words said and unsaid. Pot bound in self-doubt, deep rooted. Look at her. Look at her, hair done, clean mask on, looking like she's winning, but as she gardens, she must unpluck the fucks she spent unguarded time tending, drilling willing furrows for others to drop their own fucks into and embedding. No more, no more, no more unconscious fucking, no more. She draws a line at that shore. Perhaps the storm that bought her trauma has actually cleared a pathway for her. She sings a sweet fuck it for not knowing the answers. Fuck it to the shoulda, woulda, coulda dances. Fuck it for her passion swings and clashes. Fuck it for the changing plans and crushes. Fuck it to the broken and unwoken haters. Fuck it to the fear in her bones that craters. Fuck it to the people pleasing for social inclusion. And fuck it to anyone who questions her qualification for she is wild and worthy, which does not need to be a piece of paper on. What she needs right now is to run into crashing salty waves to stop to scream, be silent, to slightly fucking misbehave, to rest the tension in her soul, release the chi and let it go. Fuck it, fuck it, fuck it. Thank you. <laughs> I like a bit release the chi. Yeah, I thought you might like that. <laughs> release the chi, let her go. <laughs> um, okay, so that's that's my opener. Fuck it. Um, and then uh, I wrote this a few weeks ago, and this is quite simply called breath, and it is uh, written for these times and these last few months. Hospital corridors lung full of deep breath takers, preparing bodies for differently inflated lives, unknown PSIs, we chest up, chin up, push on through doors to lives swung wide. I'm so sorry that before I just didn't see. I guess it was ventilation blindness and respiration supremacy, breath fragility, literally right in front of me, under my nose, coming in and out of me, connecting and sustaining us all. Breathing is just so very 2020. I never thought how to breathe in the 1980s. I was just kind of born into it. The only threats of being Indiana Jones and the Goonies, quicksand, muddy bogs and boa constrictors, stuck between two brothers on sticky back plastic back car seats. He breathed on me, mum. I got no space to reach my edges in true oxygenated democracy, our mutually beneficial rights to breathe are starting to seem a fond memory. 
Delicious lungfuls, gulping, holding, drawing, kissing, panting, sexing, laughing, dance flooring, swirling through rooms of intoxicated sharing, frivolous intake and reckless exhausting, our fierce life free flowing, filling each other up, up, up to brimful ballooning, high on life and transcending, not deflating and descending, but getting higher, higher, higher. Higher, higher on just fucking breathing. We are in such a fog right now. Thick air to eyes and lungs, but we are in here. That source breath that birthed you, remember, connects you to your fire. It just needs your kiss of life to find and reignite you to take you higher. Deep, breathe deeply to meet yourself in darkness and deflation. We call a breath giver a ventilator, not the life support that it actually offers. This planet and its resources, bird song and human voices, art in warm caresses, music, books and creatives, they are our true life supporters and just so very 2020. Thanks. Um, I don't know how long I've got. How long have I got? Oh yeah, time for one more. Yeah. It's okay. Fine. I've got a tiny one and a smaller one. That's fine. Yeah. All right. Okay. Cool. So this tiny one is actually um, it's actually a, an accidental poem that I wrote in a text message to my husband a few weeks ago, um, and I wrote it because we this whole lockdown and um, I've had a bit of kind of, you know, we've all had a bit of a tricky old time. And um, so we've been going to the sea a lot and swimming in the sea um, kind of every weekend. And I just texted this to him the other day. I think the sea has saved us. Space, rhythm and water memory of all who have been lost and lost themselves in it, ebbing and flowing, perhaps today, we are the lucky ones, saved by the sea. That was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, and then um, and then this one is a bit, a bit kind of a bit of an uplift at the end, and this is called Six Months from Now, and it starts. Six months from now, everything and nothing will have changed. We'll all just be a bit weird and wired and rearranged, hopefully owning our breathing and settling. Looking back through rehypnal tinted glasses from the dealer of time to numb our traumas, we'll be a bit freer as we've skinned down and shed change the bits we'd grown to dread, the boxes that didn't fit us anyway, just needing that push sometimes to see the things that don't serve us and choose instead to play. There'll be sadness for the losses, the shoulda, woulda, coulda reflectives, but once we've crossed the lines not drawn by us, heard our authentic inner voices, stardust will reroute in us and we'll rise up through all of this. But I will warn you that if you see me, I will cross the street to hug you, kiss you, hold you down and absorb you. In our year of overspending on previous memories of all our fondling, I have an abundance of human touch fermenting with a keen post-COVID credit rating. Oh, I love it. Oh, thank you so much. I really like that last one. It's very uplifting. It gives you that kind of like, yeah, that. Future. We got this. We got it. The hugs. The hugs. Come on. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Yeah, that's amazing. Has anyone got anything that I'd like to say? Um, yeah, I've got something I'd like to say. <laughs> something to look forward to. Your poem. Ah, uh, yeah. Thanks, James. It, yeah, your rhythm patterns are spectacular. You roll off the tongue so well. Oh, thanks yeah. so much. That's beautiful. The way you construct and you do it again and again. It's not it's not just a, 
a fluke or it is is spectacular oh, really really it's something kind. thanks poppy really kind yeah i felt like i was being like i feel like i was being carried through it by your voice like it was lovely oh thank you thank you thank you uh, uh, I think you're really, really, t I think you're exceptionally talented as a writer. And it's, it's quite surprising that you've only taken up writing in the past two years. Well, I had some kids. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, um, did you always sort of feel like, you know, drawn to writing as a younger person? Or was it something that you couldn't really get into until you were older? Yeah, well, I did. Um, I, I was in theatre years ago. And then I moved down here to go to Dartington College of Arts. Um, I did a theatre degree down there and then I became a teacher and I'm a dyslexia specialist and teacher now and I've kind of been doing that and had children and and then it's just kind of like this thing that's always there I've got to I've got to have I've got to have an arts thing I've got to be involved in performing and writing and doing stuff and so I think it just kind of kicked in actually sometimes as it does a, a real point of adversity when I had this health crises thing it was my way of screaming about it and I actually I actually had a bit of a kind of media campaign about what because I had a mesh implant and I don't know whether people might have heard of that it was a really awful thing and so I had a really big campaign to kind of get that noticed and brought to the media attention mm. so um and I so I wrote for that and then have kind of kept doing that since and so, but now it was, I think it's sometimes it, you lose your confidence if you don't do it for a while. Um, but now I'm kind of like, right, come on. <laughs> Have you um, had more time this year to write because of lockdowns and everything? Like, has that brought it out even more? Kind of, yeah, a bit more, a bit more. And I think, I think I just, um, I think it's just getting to a point in your life where you kind of go, do you know what this is this is a real passion that I've always had I've just not known I've not had the drive or not had the time and I, I think you make time don't you and then when you feel a bit more inspired and able and I think I feel very inspired to use this as a way certainly at the moment it's a it is a it's a way of kind of um yeah maintaining processing mental health stuff I think is a is it's really really useful and helpful and hopefully other people can feel that as well yeah yeah definitely thank you for that it's amazing oh uh, thanks so much for having me really yeah. looking forward to hearing everyone else's yeah yeah thank you um our next performer actually hasn't come on to the um the zoom thing so it wasn't it was supposed to be baz ahmed um but Slain McGough Davy is now here to fill his space. Yeah, yeah. So, do you want to sit on there? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, um, in case um, I'm not going to say too much, but um, Baz, my heart's out to you tonight. He's just lost a relative to COVID. So, um, and I lost a, a friend last week to COVID as well. So, I've lost two friends this year. So, understand that feeling. Do you mean? Um, it is a serious thing, and I wish more people would take it serious. Do you mean? Anyway, on some happiness, because I'm just going to do silly ones. And I'll, you were asking earlier on, Philippa, what I was showing. It's me yes, and yeah. it's me and she. Oh, but <laughs> I collect dolls and make dolls up and punk them up. So I've got lots. <laughs> I, I quote stories and backlogs for them. They've, there's lots of stories. I've got so many dolls. I don't no longer know what's real, if they are real or not, or if you think they're real. But these are, that's cheap. That's yeah, I love how she's got the crazy hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I like. I wanted she to be quite eccentric, because she's quite eccentric, you see. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's that one. And uh, so I thought I'd do, I haven't read this one at all yet in public, so I don't know how to go. And it's written on a piece of paper. It's so technical, it's just written on you know, I, I'm, I basically think I'm from the 17th century. And I don't understand technology. Basically, I have lots of cats, lots of books, and then that's what that's where I think I am living in the 17th century. And I'm shocked I'm here in the 21st century. I just want to go back in time. So this is called a bit of rough of a seagull or a penguin. Isolation and desolation, self-isolation and socialism 
What, that Nazi seagull, those lockdowns and imprisonment, alone in an endless cycle of drilling, drilling, drilling? She, can you stop drilling, please? Alone, gardening, gardening, making out, making out, making out, and the seagull with the big black eyes stares at me. The dead old pasties. No, I don't like Cornish pasties. The dead old pasties. Won't turn me on. I won't get turned on by your Cornish pasties. Knocking on my window every morning like a seagull. Knock on the window, the seagull knocks on my window. That seagull won't turn me on. He terrorizes me. He's my terrorist. I think he's friends with Trump or Boris. Hey, Mr. Seagull, tell me to just fuck off, can't you? Just fuck off, Mr. Seagull. Just stop banging on my window. Did you hear the seagull, people? He's on the window now. He bangs every morning. He's a bitch from hell and an armchair anarchist who goes, please, please, no, Mr. Copper. Instead, he gets on my rooftop and throws stones down my chimney with those big black eyes. He stares at me. He stares at me. Tip for tap, tip for tap, he goes down my chimney. Tip for tap, tip for tap, sounds a rumble down the chimney. Father Christmas, please don't sit on my knee. I don't need another paedophile. It's a form of insanity. Typing, typing, typing away. Seagull, 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 seagull. A form of insanity. Seagull, seagull, seagull. I can see you, Gabby, with your eyes looking up. And this has become my life. The seagull that haunts my memories and my dreams. A reflection of life in isolation, socialization, isolation, dissolution, socialization, socialism, Nazi seagull. I tell my grandchildren in the future not about lockdown Boris or Trump or about Black Lives Matters, but about a terrorist seagull that bloody terrorized me with his big black eyes looking at me like that. He takes away my civil liberties. He knocks on the window. He is the tip for tap, tip for tap seagull. So just fuck off, Mr. Seagull. And Santa Claus, I don't care about having a present because I don't need a paedophile sitting on my knee. Another red reindeer being abused with a carrot, not my kind of thing. Hey, chip away, chip away with that ketchup. Mr. Seagull, Nazi Seagull. There you go, that's the first one. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, one I've done a lot and I've done it a lot with kids and stuff. And, uh, and I've done it a lot at, at festivals and I, it's normally it's a bit hard to get people to engage in this. Normally, I get the audience engaging with me, and they they and it's really called um, Bugadesh, and it was sort of done because Gabby was in my front room, who can speak twenty six languages, and um, so it's kind of about Gabby and a tiny bit maybe about Queen Chi, but I'm, I do encourage everybody to dethrone Queen Chi. <laughs> Not possible. Boogadesh, Boogadesh, the art of the streets and endless beehives. The ending death that eats my own peanut butter. Boogadesh, Boogadesh, Boogadesh. Big black eyes stare at me, those naughty cows with those deep eyes. Those deep eyes that want to lick me clean as if I was a strawberry ice cream. In some kind of game serving the hot guests, hot tea, pre-war lust, taste of their little legs dripping in hot wax. Bugadesh. What is Bugadesh? Does anybody know what Bugadesh is? Bugadesh, Bugadesh, Bugadesh. Because I've made the word up. I have no idea what Bugadesh is. If you have an idea what Bugadesh is, please write in on the feed. I do not know. I've made it up. But have I made up? Or do I really know what Bugadesh is? Bugadesh, Bugadesh, Bugadesh. Yeah. These cows, these nutters of the field, they stare at me. These birds fly high. They die from too much Coca-Cola. And I tell you what, they eat too many pasties. That's not good for you. Those pasties that seem to love in my front room. A pasty sex making love orgy. While the English girls speak Spanish. Bugadesh and black, black, black eyes and darkness of being a goth and speaks 26 languages. Mystical lines of carrots and fags and cats in one hand, 
and weird shit the phone makes in the other hand. Bugadesh, yes, it's a Sunday like no other. It's Bugadesh in Slains, Bugadesh, with an artist, I think, called Gabby Marcus Temple. Bugadesh, Gabby, Bugadesh, Chi, and Bugadesh, Wonder Zoo. <laughs> Whee! I'll read my last piece. I hope this is not going to be too controversial. This is a nice one about the NHS. It's called Misery. Suicide and depression, cold coffee and cigarettes, ashtrays filled with another broken tear. Like I really give a shit that you lie on this ward and cry and moans and groans because I just want a cup of tea and a bit of silence, please. You fucking bastard. Just shut the fuck up. To take another one, to take another one of my silence away. Can you please stop your moans and groans and stop moaning just for a second, just because you're in pain like a give a fucking shit? The endless scrabbles and broken dreams of puke filled lungs like the razor blades. I'll give you a razor blade if you can just shut up for me, please, for one minute so I can have a bit of peace and quiet. I just want to die in peace, not your endless misery. Maybe, maybe I might give a shit when you're dead. But in the end, drink your cold coffee. It's too sacred to go to the shops. Spiritual heavens in the blessed shop. As I want to die, don't feed me those stupid flowers. I don't need flowers. I rather have dead flowers. But please just keep giving me your cuddles, your endless cuddles, like I really want to cuddle from you. Your complaints, your complaints, your moaning, your moaning, your razor bitch blade moaning. Please just fucking die and shut up. There you go. <laughs> and that's me. That, that was a nice one about being in the NHS and how wonderful and beautiful place it is. <laughs> Do you want some grapes as well as your flowers? <laughs> yeah, we had to um, we had to go to Derryford Hospital um, bef sometime before COVID. It was, and um, we had to wait in A and E for like six hours, and we didn't. We still didn't actually get to see a doctor, so we were just in there writing poems about how much we hated being in A&E. <laughs> I've just <laughs> not to introduce everyone to Mini Slane. Oh, yes. The, um, ooh. That's Mini Slane. That kind of reminds me, actually, like, because it's, it's me next doing my poetry, but I'll just show you guys my painting that I've been work, working on. Um. I don't know if you guys can see. That's the uh, my self-portrait. It's actually got the um, slain doll in it. But um, yeah, it's, it's finished now. It's got kind of like me with a microphone, which kind of represents like me enjoying, you know, having a voice, as well as me enjoying cock. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, Slane, for your wonderful poetry. Um, so now it's my turn to read some stuff. All right, so where am I? Um, so yeah, I had um, I had a child when I was uh, thirty-one. So that was about five years ago. And whilst I was pregnant, uh, I just wrote a poem about what it felt like to be pregnant. Um, it's called Fetus. Unfurling blossom of cells, unraveling and enlivening into chemical flesh, molecular mechanisms of atomic precision, fueled by love and hope, curled into a nest of dreams, infinite possibilities created in a single moment, believing in an eternal yes, all of me and more, changing into a greater self, one animal's return to nature, one animal's victory of heart over mind of life over death so that was me being pregnant um 
next one is actually I've got a couple that I wrote when I was actually um, a mum like of young kids. So the first one's called Sleepless. Uh, sleepless nights with children screaming, like a nightmare without the dreaming. Now they're awake and want to play. I can't be fucked with it today. <laughs> um, that kind of epitomizes <laughs> what it's like to have two young kids. Next one is called nappies. If there's one thing in life that does not make me happy, it's changing my child's feces filled nappy. You must think quick, you must plan ahead, or as I've just witnessed, they'll shit on your bed. <laughs> so I don't know if anyone has uh, had young kids and experienced that, maybe you can relate. <laughs> uh, I, lived, I lived in an area called Whitley um, when I, when I had my two kids, basically I lived in this like this area in Plymouth called Whitley, which if anyone knows Plymouth, it's like, you just don't want to live in Whitley. It's uh, one of the worst places. It's uh, quite remote. It's quite deprived, um, pretty depressing. So this poem is called Whitley. The rain pours down outside as I sit on a cold coffee, looking out the window at a magpie walking on the rooftops of strangers greys and magnolias, cars and concrete, same routine of chores again, keeping the kids alive. I can't let the monotony break me. I do what I can to survive. Yeah, it was pretty dire. Thank God I'm not living there anymore. <laughs> Five years of just staring at the same view every single day. Um, I also wrote this one actually when I was up there, it's called Garden. I sit in my garden that I have created, away from the world of the worker ants, away from the robotic beings that go about their day. I sit in my garden and contemplate beauty. I look into my mind and search for insight and answers. I search for passion and madness. I wish to leave the world behind and sit in my garden surrounded by nature's wild creativity. I ask for my wildness to be unearthed and the fetters of sterility and fear to be released. I've created a place of safety that I've never had before, where time does not exist, nor money. Only feelings and a voice inside me that gets louder as I shut out the cacophony of the machine world. So that was uh, kind of, yeah, up in Whitley was where I sort of started writing, I guess, about six years ago. Um, okay, I've got some that are a little bit rude. So um, if you don't like rude things re referring to genitalia, please switch off now. <laughs> uh, this one's called Ode to Anus. The anus is a thing that we all have. It has more nerve endings than a vagine. So next time you think of making love, have a play and you'll see what I mean. <laughs> I can see the claps, but I can't hear them. <laughs> <I'm mute. laughs> oh, to clitoris. Oh, clitoris, you are a lovely bean, though oft ignored and oft not even known. To honor you is surely not obscene. The queen of pleasure, you deserve a crown. Thank you. <laughs> and <into> that. <laughs> and uh, Ode to Penis is my final one. O oh, phallus, noble kingsman, stand erect with power and desire in your eye. So handsome, strong and bold, yet delicate, your beauty and mystique, I can't deny. And that's me done. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> so, Queen Chi, would you like to uh, comment on your performance? Oh, uh, yes. yes. <laughs> oh, thanks, guys. Um, if anyone would like to say anything, please do. If not, we'll move on to our next person. Oh no, it's our, it's a break next. If anyone, if uh, if anyone has has anything to say. Oh, Kerry Baker said, "Love the ode to the anus." Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I like. I like the um, 
they're, they're, they're utterly fearless, those puns. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. brilliant, isn't it? I loved it. I, uh, uh, ten minute break, so get a cup of tea and then come back, yeah? Yeah, so we'll see you about uh, just after half past. So we're going to go into the second half now, and um, in this half we've got the wonderful James Turner, all the way from Exeter. We've got Poppy Jones, poet from Plymouth, Gabby Markellis Temple, and then we're finishing off with uh, Odd Step Deployment Unit, which is Experimental Electronica. So I'll just go straight to James. Hi, James. Hello. Lovely uh, to see you and your uh, wonderful, beautiful face. Well, I brought it with me from Exeter. <laughs> It would have been a bit macabre otherwise. <laughs> yeah. So here's um here's a I'll I'll, I'll start um with I'll tell you what I'll start I'll start with a poem. Mm -hmm. It's called it's a from my book of sonnets, which is called the book's called A Chance of Love. There's a photograph of a dandelion seed head on there, taken by me many years ago, and it. This poem is, is called Chat Before Conception. Um, so it's, it's a conversation between an unborn soul about to um, join up with a, a fetus when it's um, been started off on the, on the journey to, uh, well, old age, hopefully. Um, but it starts off as a fetus. So Chat Before Conception. Want to be born? What, me? Yes, you. Some question. Well, do you? Now's your chance. How should I know? Pearl grey forever here. And if I go, there's colour, hunger, food and indigestion. There's grief as well as joy. Will I be wise? Unlikely, but a chance of love or not? A chance. If I can't stand the pain, then what? There's always death. Hmm. What would you advise? The whole thing's up to you. I'm interested. The start's the tricky part. Dependency? Correct. You mean you cannot guarantee two decent parents? Right. And when I'm dead? No second chance. All right. I'll go. No, wait, I've one more question. Sorry, friend. Too late. <laughs> so there goes the soul on the path down to the surface of the globe to be united with its body in the form of a fetus to grow up. And after a while, um, the fetus will attain, attain the heady status of childhood. And here's a poem called Generation. The child kind of negotiating his way, happens to be a male child. I suppose it's me really, uh, through or into middle class things. Generation. I come from where red houses multiplied. Wild daffodils gave way to gaudier blooms. And on the walls of inward looking rooms hung paintings of a vanished countryside. I come from where red houses stood, correct and square and built to last. And still they stand. 
My father's father was the builder and my mother's father was the architect. From time to time, I go back there in my head and there, age five, I'm present at a birth. Our black cat having kittens on my bed. I run to tell my mother, overjoyed that such a thing could happen on this earth. You can't imagine why she's so annoyed. Hmm. So this is what you learn about. You start off all full of life and enthusiasm, and you learn that, well, when you grow up, it's um, somehow the reasons for being wonderfully enthusiastic and appreciative of the unexpected beauty and surprising miracle of life and its happenings. The reasons for getting excited about that seem to drop away somewhat with some people anyway. So now we'll have something that's on my on my laptop. Uh, James, are you still there? I think James has frozen. <laughs> okay, I think, I don't know what's happened to James. <laughs> yeah, something's happened to his internet connection, I think. Let's see if he, he, he might come back in a minute. Let's see. <laughs> he might have had to restart his computer or something. I think just go yeah, else. we'll just go go and to our to yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get James to come say the rest of it if he comes back. But um next up we've got Plymouth Poet singer and outdoor swimmer, Poppy Jones. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, okay, that's, that's not that. Um, right, I'm going to read the one that was in the anthology and then I'm going to bubble through some other rubbish. Uh, do when it says it. We'll just start with that. Uh, hmm. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, pain in the bum. There we go. Yay! Second tap. We meet in a back room in Woodbridge. Fallen through a flume of history, unknowingly ended here again. Fingers clutching black Russian, blushing at a dull conversation that I have no place in. My eyes are baubles on your tongue, strung about the roof of your shoulders and they're catching. Older than I remember, they're folding in on themselves as if more shelved from reading than I have in me. Simply read plays on the jukebox. A fluke of mass proportion as I pass myself back to playing pool in your old watering hole, passing out in front of your TV, pattering at midnight desperate, desperate to pee, losing, losing myself over the idea that you might hear me. And then we stood here in this dank congregation. They've grown their hair. They're droning on big balls about what falls short on the other one. And I imagine watching the sun hinge up wallside, reflected on the dullness in your eyes that once rolled as baubles on my tongue. And I hum simply red. Imagine the things we may have said or shared before the affair went stale and I moved on. The feeling prolongs as if an offbeat metronome where there's a home in you, a restless version, as a short nostalgia built to inflict pain, to heal the sane and well-rested on a comfy sofa. You pinch a cigarette, the rest did, find a place on that old pub pew. And I look at you with the same wide-eyed, long-soaked saliva love dust, somehow rusted, unchecked with age, turned meek and beige in the lull of us. I wonder what the fuss was then, ruddling your body as an unpickled hen, so naive and hungry, too in a hurry to be cherished. But when it was dished, we really didn't want it. 
And that's the truth, isn't it? That's the truth. Okay, uh, I'm going to do a moany one and then I might find a lighter one and finish it around. So, a COVID childhood. Some people may have heard this because I read it a lot because I like it. Um, okay. <clears throat> I drove to Derby, birthed by a hundred heels, dug in and spat out on a motorway of free promises of elderly wishes and a youngster who's full of mother blame and missing her relatives. And it is relative. See, I'm blamed for the virus, the implications that it places upon her, her expectations of me. Oh, I'm accountable if I don't meet them. If she or those she loves get sick. I sip a coconut coffee. Jam, spare change, weighted with my own guilt and anxiety into the pocket between the radio, blasting the news on the hour, every hour, and my aircon. Blasting due to the high heat expected on this overcast day. She rests after reading a tiger came to tea. And a tiger did come to tea. It ate all the soft clothes and the coffee shops and the people and it ate the economy and her family and her friends and it ate her youth and then it spat out splatters for me. Innocence for me. Dregs for me to mould into something. Mm -hmm. And then um, I really, really haven't been writing for a while. Um, I've really just struggled. I just hit a lull. Um, I loved coming out and sitting in a pub and, and drinking a Tim Maria and pretending that I wasn't mother for half a night. And then obviously this all happened and, and the motivation falls short. You write, I suppose I write because it lightened the load in motherhood. Um, and, and if it's just something you want to moan into while well, that's lovely I, I'd rather go swimming or I'd rather, you know just the honest truth of it for me anyway I did manage to sit down and write yesterday and it's not particularly good but I thought I'd read it for the sake of being in the presence of company and, and that being a healthy thing for me to do so here I am balloon it's been so quiet inside these walls while great finches flick down upon me to peck at the tether and I wait in the endless line of our exchange for claws to break through, for your moon-coloured hands to dangle me as if a belated balloon that's weighted on a string, who'd sail swiftly across an empty sky given half the chance, and then she'd fall upon someone else's washing line and spend the rest of her life there. Mm. Mm. That's that's kind of it, unless you want to hear the other one that was in the anthology, but there's no pressure. I don't know what the time yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What's on a spring uh, on a spring tide, it's like a swimmy one. Um, so I'll I'll do that one and then I'll push off. Right. On a spring tide, the moon slithers, tumbles across the wide ocean and sky, and I howl up to her in her glory still as days before when choruses howled at the penumbra, cloaked in cloud. I give guttural thanks and smallness for the suffering within my womb, walls crashing in, storms rushing through as if carried on a spring tide. The neat is coming. I hold my stomach. Nothing numbs the aching. A home remains there. An age in the back, hips, wrists, all quietly grieving a loss. It was never wanted. And it wasn't used, but it seems to me it's a loss of opportunity, of being female, of ownership and my youth. I place cloth against my flesh, attach that between the thighs and allow the relief to wash over me, to reel me in and comfort me. I allow the gentility of my being to send me out into a reality and give over to the acceptance of it. I lift a pencil from the dresser and imprint a little dot on my lunar calendar for the day. A small grey speck on a pale printed circle that sums up my parts. History creating or not creating. The recording of patterns really does bring its own pleasure though. A pleasure that a cycle unmasked, unmarked simply cannot. There you go. That was really cool. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed that. It's great. Yeah. See you because we haven't actually had you on Wonder Zoo for quite a few months, have we? Yeah, 
yeah. No. yeah, lovely to see you because obviously, like, we see each other on Facebook, don't we? But we don't get to talk much. <laughs> no, no, it's it's the busyness of life, isn't it? Like, I come under key worker, so I'm just endlessly, endlessly working. What, what do you do? Is it what's your um key worker role? I'm a childminder. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I've got like, um, I've just got, yeah, really families that just need you. They just need yeah, you. Yeah. Got to work. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, it was great. Hmm. Oh, Pip, uh, Pip, Pip says, I really feel that, Poppy, sometimes there can be really low periods where it's too difficult to put pen to paper. Yeah. That's in reference to what you said about not writing so much. It just sometimes feels unhealthy, and it feels like at the moment in this kind of lockdown world, we really can't afford to engage with too much unhealthy. Um, certainly when you look at mental health statistics being on the rise, it's not something I'm allowing to, into my being. I, I want it to be a positive space now. Where, where I, when I was a teenager, I used writing for being a grumpy so-and-so. I really want to use it for positivity now. And I choose that to be when I allow myself to write. It's just, mm. it's a good place. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely agree with that. Because sometimes, like, sometimes if you are in a bad place, like, what you write down isn't always like when you manifest that it isn't always a healthy thing to do if that makes sense yeah. like I definitely relate to that and like when I was writing my dissertation it was around the time where um, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd had been killed and it was just like it was I I wish I didn't have my dissertation at that time because it was so difficult to like mm. I felt like I was purging myself of emotions during that bad time and like I de yeah I definitely agree with that and I think you have such a strong strong sense of voice and there's like so many like images that that popped out. I mean, like being cloaked in a cloud and and that kind of thing. That just yeah, it really resonated. The one thing I would I would say is a negative to my outlook, certainly at your age and having gone through those sorts of things around your dissertation, is sometimes it is a really really good medium. Sometimes having a negative resource is is a good thing. And I think social media very much tells us that if it's not positive, it's not useful. And that's not actually accurate. And, and I do worry for people your age and younger who are believing that if it's not upbeat, then it's not worth writing, not yeah. worth doing, not worth participating in. Um, it is. It just you don't, you don't have to share it. You can yeah. still do it. You can still journal, but burn it at the end of the year. Don't sit on yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely agreed. It's fine. I've, I've just, you know, like splurge, like purge out onto the page write it down it's like yeah I'm not looking at that again because if I see yeah, that it will I'm remind me <laughs> you and I are not friends yeah <laughs> definitely yeah. um James has actually come back to us hi James hi I'm sorry about that I clicked on the wrong little button and and instead of minimizing the zoom or I don't know I was going to move it to one side actually but I must have click the the, the 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 close button by mistake but anyway i've got back again and uh yeah i'll, I'll carry on I'll, I'll do about five or six minutes now is that all right I, I can't remember how much i did i think i might have done about four minutes that's fine yeah or five minutes i'll do five minutes anyway yeah. here goes um so what was i going to do i know what i was going to do you see this that i found that in a i found that in a in a, in a shop in Cambridge and I thought what the hell's that I didn't see this bit but even if I had I probably wouldn't have twigged to what it was and I picked it off the shelf and I was sort of looking at it like this and it and I, I, I asked the shopkeeper what it was and she said it's a thunder tube <laughs> so that's rather good so there we are thunder really okay cool. after that I will do another poem and uh, where have I got it to? Where have I got this? I've got one about lockdown. I found about lockdown and writing was that um, I used to write by going and sitting in a cafe. but I couldn't do that anymore. So I've got used to writing at home, which in a way is quite good because I never did write at home before. And if I couldn't get to a cafe, I just didn't write. But I went to a hell of a lot of cafes, which if you haven't got much money, is expensive. You can't really sit there and not drink a coffee or have something. Anyway, I do as I'm instructed. July 2020, age 74, 
I do as I'm instructed and no more. Like many babies, I was born a rebel, protesting loudly in my new found treble. My mother told me that a few years later, she'd find me on the back lawn, drinking water from dirty, rain-filled snail shells. I felt freed, initiative's reward. She disagreed. As pigs, restrained by one encircling wire, suppress their urge to escape, so I'd soon tire of spontaneity, be good and obey. Hands held me so I couldn't get away. Shouts and slaps would serve as electric shocks. And thenceforth, my prison doors required no locks. Now, lockdown, gets me down. It's clearly right, but a bad boy demon feeds my dreams at night. Right, a bit of perspective. This is called Until the Last Star Fades. When I die, you'll survive me. You'll find you can let me go. You'll live. But when you die, there'll still be love and lovers and brief bereavements. But when these two have vanished, the humble mole and cockroach and certain deep sea creatures or just certain bacteria adapted to extremes may survive the cold and dark of nuclear winter to give evolution a second chance to create an intelligence incapable of malice. And when life ends, the earth will remain, its rocky landscapes and sandstorm winds and when the sun swells up to swallow the earth, there'll be the sun. And when the sun goes out, other stars will burn to light the emptiness. Until when the last star fades or explodes. Meanwhile, there's now, there's spring, summer, autumn, winter, spring. We'll live. And one final, one final, one final poem. What am I gonna do? What shall I do? I think I'll do, I know what, I'll end on a really depressing one too. To give the next poet a chance to lift the um, lift. Don't! Lift the... I'm already crying. <laughs> what? I'm already crying. That was beautiful. Was I thought it? I should say. It was oh, like... thank you. Oh well, yeah. It, it's oh really? Yeah. Oh, it, it's 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 um, it's a strange thing. It's an old poem actually, um, which I revised slightly, but not very much. Um. Okay, this is about, this is from a series of 20 poems um, I wrote when I was recovering from a breakdown, which happened in 2015. And it was depression and anxiety going to an extreme as usual, not as usual, but as, as often is the cause of a breakdown. Um, and these are the first two, and I'll do one of them. I think I'll do for a start, for a start. And it, it mentions some of my favorite author, my favorite author, one of my favorite authors in it. For a start, there is no poetry in it. Poetry, apart from being words, 
is that non-verbal admixture without which depression rules the realm of consciousness. Depression is when you reach the end of the line. Depression isn't sadness, isn't an emotion at all, but a blockage, a block in which emotion is frozen, though fear flows readily under it. And around it float wisps of general negativity. The theory of whose erratic movements still awaits its Albert Einstein. Even guilt at not being able to feel emotions such as love and gratitude is stuck there, frozen, almost. Words cannot convey depression, but with the idiot, crime and punishment, the brothers Karamazov and the devils, Dostoevsky gets close. Think of it, depression so severe that reading and rereading those four great Russian novels not only keeps you going, but actually cheers you up. The weird light they shed throws into relief a wealth of detail embroidered on the black bedspread. The importance of suffering, the mechanics of cruelty, the temptation of suicide. Dostoevsky knows, like no other author, the basement room where light so seldom penetrates. His books are the only books I can bear to read. Empathy isn't the same as imagining yourself in another's place. As you will know, if you've ever been clinically depressed and people have tried to empathize. Thank you. Thank you, James. On that jolly note, I'll bow out. <laughs> there, was, there was light at the end of the tunnel. If you read all those 10 poems, they're not utterly, they don't leave you a hope with a total feeling of, you know. So is um, Dostoevsky your favourite author? He's one of them. Yes, he's one of them. And he, he did keep me going through those times. I, I couldn't read anything else because nobody else really seemed to understand. So um, have you read... But they are kind of exciting. So they sort of, you know, they, they got cliffhangers at the end of chapters and all sorts of things like that, you know. they. I, I enjoyed reading Crime and Punishment. Yeah. But that's, I haven't read that's, the other ones that you mentioned. Yeah, well, there's still time. Yeah, I will do. <laughs> <laughs> but I, if, you know, I, I can't put them down one, once I start one. But mind you, I haven't read them since I got better, really. But I, 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 I'm reading a, a, a fifth one, which is almost as good as the others, which, um, which, I'm, which I'm enjoying, actually. But it's not quite the same sort of story with, with characters in it. It's just one chap, sort of. What's your favourite Dostoevsky novel? Uh, well, the one I've just read, or the one I'm in the middle of, whichever one that is, basically, that's the truth. I, I really don't know. Probably the best constructed and the best as a work of art is the one you're reading, that uh, Crime and Punishment. Oh, yeah, I read that before, yeah. Not because much. the others have got, like, long bits which go on a bit. Like, there's, I don't know, there's... There's, there's an interrogation. I thought that was too long in, in Crime and Punishment, but actually, if you read it, that interrogation is amazing. It's just astonishing. The conflict. Oh, yeah, it's, it's complicated. Anyway, I, I, I like them all. I like them all. I really do. All four of them. Oh, you've encouraged me to actually read the other ones that you've mentioned. I think, yeah. Uh, I did really enjoy, yeah, Crime and Punishment. Yeah. Um, it's great to see you, James, and thank you for sending us the book. Right, and thank you for sending yours, and thank you for inviting me to this. I'm enjoying it very much. Good, and uh, next up we've got Gabby Markellis Temple, so I'm going to um, get out of this chair and let her take a seat. He throwing the queen. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who's wondering, I don't actually live with Slane and Chi, but my children live upstairs, so we're treating this house as one household. Um, yeah, James, um, 
did say um, that it was up to the next reader to raise the mood. Anyone who's heard my work before, that that's not going to happen. Um, so yeah, if you if you're suicidal, th this is your moment. Um, I many years ago I wrote a trilogy of short fiction about homelessness because I'd been homeless three times. Um, so I, I wrote three stories about it. Um, recently, although I've, I've got somewhere to live now, um, I was made homeless again due to domestic abuse. And I've actually found out tonight that a, a friend of mine has also been made homeless for the same reason. Um, so the reason I'm reading through these stories again is because um, I'm considering writing a fourth piece um, because the first three, starting with when I was homeless as a child, then as a teenager, then as an adult, um, the mental health in the stories deteriorates and deteriorates. And this time I've, I've taken it fairly well. Um, I've managed to hold myself together and I've managed to use a lot of coping strategies. So this is why I'm thinking of writing about it again. And this is the, the second one. This is about, um, I had a very violent and abusive stepfather um, who kicked me out of the house when I was 18. Um, so as I said, I'm not going to raise the mood. Sorry, James. Um, hopefully odd step deployment unit will do that after me. Um, but yeah, this one's called Leaving Home. Now I'm running in the dark, pushing myself to go as fast as I can. I've just shot out the window and he's always faster than me, but not this time. I've been running these paths for months now, hours and hours every day. I veer off to the left and start stumbling over stones, rocks rolling away under my feet. I get to the top and double over, sweating in the dark and can't hear anything other than my own breath. Nothing. The blackness weighs down on me from all sides and I huddle down in the muddy leaves and start to sob. Huge ragged gasps in the night, most of it fear of the dark. I stand up and brush the dirt off wipe my face clear of slime, time to walk, muttering to myself in the gloom, praying and cursing all along the hedges, breathe, pace yourself, watch out for that fucking dog, one foot in front of the other, keep going, doesn't matter if it takes all night, you can't go back, finally I'm there, lights, laughter and voices shine out of the old grey building, I stop in the yard, dirty face pressed to cool moss on the wall. I want to cry again, but I need to conserve my strength for knocking on the door. It's a big wooden door, impassable in the dark. I wish I hadn't knocked when it swings open. More shouting. Her dad's as bad as mine, worse in some ways, but you learn to be quick growing up like that and she's already got her bag and we're gone. Not straight to the pub, not yet. There's a street light in the village, and I wash my face in the stream before she does my eye makeup and helps me dust off the worst of the mud. We're already laughing like mad. The sight of that dirty old man there in the doorway, spitting and swearing, those awful pyjamas scooped up in one hand. Neither of us have any money, too quick out the house. And he rolls his eyes when he sees us walk in. But we know it's payday and we know he owes us. The bar's packed, it's Friday night. We know half the people in there and they've all seen our sort before. He takes us into the back room tonight. His stammer's worse than ever. Can't make out a word. So he laughs his shy smile at us from behind long hair and we follow him. The back room's quieter, entirely more civilised. The only thing that assaults us is the pattern on the carpet. His friend is at a table on his own eating onion rings. He's subdued and well-spoken, soft eyes like a dog. She's all over him like a rash, of course, the usual tactics. Long red hair flicking around and that charming trace of brogue just hinted at when she speaks. I'm back in the corner with him. He's supposed to be meeting his girlfriend, but he never does. Not sure why she puts up with it, but she does. The pub's closing and we pour into the gravelly car park for a smoke. She's on the bonnet of the new guy's car, legs like a giraffe wrinkling her nose and passing straight on to me. I give her my backy and watch him fall over his own feet. We take him to the beach before he goes back to his girl. The sky is a huge blanket 
flying over us on the dunes, staring through the stars. There's got to be a way out of here up there somewhere. They gamble around like puppies, shrieking and shoving along the line of seeping water. Foam trickling, shimmering grey across sand new lit by the moon. He tells me about his old job, thick fingers sprinkling and rolling and pressing. He's fallen in the sea. His baggy trousers fill with seawater and drag him over his own feet. He clasps at her and she lands on all fours, arse in the air as usual, but she always stays dry. We drop him off and laugh all the way to the next beach. The thought of him climbing in that poor girl's window, soaking wet. I don't know how I walked along here in these heels, floating on spikes above the green slime in the shadow of the cliffs, delicately balanced by a bottle. I fell from here once and he caught me. Suddenly, halfway down the cliff opposite, there's a man with a wooden leg playing the accordion. It's six o'clock in the morning and I'm grinding my teeth against all this garish yellow sand. Pull me into greenish ice blue at the crest of a wave. Pull me into a space without that town behind me. My jeans hanging loose now so things are clearly on the up. She's nicked his glasses and reclines in splendour on the rocks. We tried to call, but my voice faded to a whisper in the face of screaming spite. He tries again and smiles quizzically, the phone a foot from his ear. We start choking with laughter and gasp at the steamed up door to get out, bursting onto a silent small town street. We tried to get a place together, but they wouldn't have it, looked down their noses and told us to bring in a letter. There's no point in keeping the cuts and bruises secret when they never make any difference. Three days hold up above the castle, scared to show our faces where they seem to match every wanted poster in town. We had a corner to ourselves and we stayed in it. His stepbrother was even older than he was and you wouldn't cross his gaze for the bathroom or anything. Sitting up, making wraps, with her soft form asleep under all the blankets we had. I pulled at the corner of a cheap Indian dye across the top and her long white hand snatched it back. He told me about the night he left. The night he left his shoes on the stairs. He was 15 years old and he'd been on his own for, with her for five years, spent Christmas with his dad and his stepbrother's mum. He lay there in the deepest sleep when she slammed the shoes into his spine. He held the lighter from the top of the stairs and watched the plaster trickle out of the wall above her head when it struck. Gets a bag, gets out that night, never sees her again. We try again on the phone at night so no one sees our faces. It's her this time and she's still slurring. I wonder how long she's got. It's better just to sell the stuff and hold out. His mum thinks we're a pair of silly girls. She corners me sloping through the back of the co-op at the bottom of the hill and tells me to go home. It's eight o'clock in the morning and the others are still asleep. My jaw aches and I'm shaking so much that the stolen chocolate in my pocket starts to rustle. I give it all to them when I get back and go to cash a cheque. This woman offers us a bath from the other side of the room. She's got a pudding basin and haircut in every shade of beige and a man who laughs his own uniform right out the door. She takes a lot off us and cooks us short grain rice, something glutinous and Chinese. She grabs my fork and shovels it down so she won't see that I can't eat it, flicks over a cushion to hide a greasy orange smear. My eyes are drying out, but we all still refuse the bath. We're heading west again with some food. Feet on the dashboard, hair crawling right off my head, but I'm flying ten feet above the road, rising and falling on the thermals of a fast, repetitive beat. There's a key under the stone in the yard and we light candles in the biggest of the empty rooms, smoking to celebrate our meal. I stretch to my full length after weeks of stinking contraction in the car. The next thing it's six again and we need to be on the move. We sit in the car and watch them go, ducking down in the back. There's a cricket bat in the boot, but we take the window up afterwards. There's not much left to take. So I take a bath and put makeup on for the first time since I left. We're gone in an hour. Right. <laughs>
fucking pussy. Go away, son. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Gabby. That was really cool. It's all dark. Yeah, it was. It was. I liked. I liked it. I. I. I it's. A, it's dark and not. Not. Not a jolly nice poem, but it is not depressing. It's. It sort of moves, and you know, who knows what's going to happen next. <laughs> hmm, yeah, very interesting story. I feel uh, like she did such a good job with um, sort of like ex managing to like make us feel like we were in the place mm. that she was in as as her persona like as her, the persona in the poem was talking I just like I felt like I was there like first you're at the beach and then you know you're in the back of the co-op and like you know it's just yeah I, I felt like I was just being sort of taken to those places and that was really cool. Did you hear that Gabby? Yeah. All right you were still on like all right cool she had what you said yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to second that. I agree with all of that. It's, it's yeah, absolutely yeah. right. Spot on. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, in, it's interesting because it. I'm. I. I had a lie down because I kind of. It felt like sort of a bedtime story, but in a sort of an an accessible, real, gritty way. If that makes sense. And it wasn't. It wasn't. It was so unsettling that I couldn't relate to it. I didn't want to relate to it. I wanted to get the story. Mm. And I think it's it's that she has a. And I remember Gabby. I didn't recognise you before, but I remember you. I think you read that at taking the mic. Did you? What for taking the mic? Um. No, I read the first one of the trilogy. Okay. On taking the mic. Yeah, so um, that was when I lived in a hostel in South London when I lived about 10 and this was sort of when I was 18 and I got kicked out by my stepdad. I didn't recognise you. Yeah, I'll, I'll read the third one at some point. Because I just recognised your the delivery of it and that hmm. that kind of, that pace is really, really, really yeah. lovely in a not lovely way. Yeah. And turn you up because I've adjusted everything so I could do that on my phone. There we go. <laughs> oh, uh, Dane no. says uh, Mrs. Lydon would like to introduce the next act, uh, Odd Step Deployment Unit. Hello, everyone! I'd just like to say, wonderful headliner coming up. It's been a wonderful evening of great writers and performers. So, um, I see there's a bit of laughter in Exeter going on from Philippa. Oh, my hat! Oh! Oh, <laughs> go. Oh, um, he needs a paint job. <laughs> so our next, uh, our headliner of the second half is Odd Step Deployment Unit, which is made up of Lucy Daffin and Sean Daffin, and it's Experimental Electronica. Hi, Lucy and Sean, are you there? We are, yeah. Hi. So Sean's going to share his screen, and yeah, then we'll um, we'll get going. Oh, brilliant! I look forward to it.
Yeah, we're done. <laughs> oh, that was great. Oh, yeah. Hang on. Um, I've had a really great comment from James, which I'll read. It says, terrific. Reminds me of Emile Q, the French pharmacist who said, if you repeat this every day, it will come true. Day by day. <laughs> every way i'm getting better and better only he said it in french but now it's moved <laughs> oh brilliant brilliant yeah that's really cool yeah he's finished Woo! Yeah, you only gave us 20 minutes that was like one song for us pete my god Oh, brilliant. Loved it so much. Thank you so much. I think the whole idea of it that with a mix of words and images and sound it's and like all coming at you and, and round and round repeating the words. That's a brilliant concept, that is, somehow. That, that's it, why it like just worked, didn't it? It worked. That's right. Thank you. James, that's what one zoo's about. James. <laughs> 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 James. 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 <laughs> yeah, what were you saying? James, oh. James, that's what I love about Wonder Zoo is that we do things in a different way with words. In just, you know, Oxford, we do things, you know. Oh, I can't, I can't hear you very well. Sorry. I, um, I, I didn't hear that. I'll have to put my earplugs in. Yeah, if I can find them. It makes it louder. Or maybe... Can you hear us? It's a bit muffled and... um. Difficult to make out. <sighs> anyway. Can you hear us now? Yeah, that's better. I'd say I had the music coming through me hi-fi, which is a bit good. It's good on bass and, and sound, but on music, but it doesn't, it's not so good for words. Yeah, I think. <laughs> well, that's, that's what I was saying at the thing with Wonderzoo. We've always done things different to all the other poetry and spoken word groups. We've always included things that a lot of the other groups wouldn't include. Yeah, but I think that's, that's good. What, that's what makes us different. And we're never going to be any different. We're quite experimental on what we like to do. Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and to be honest with you, I'm not giving any names or whatever, but I went to a couple of groups a few years ago and I was like, oh, my God, man, this is like saying, you know, from the dark ages. And I wanted to, <laughs> wanted to Tell make it, sure. spill the beans, Pete. We want to know. <laughs> no, I'm doing it on purpose because I'm trying to be unknown. I wanted to see to always be something a bit special and a bit different and rather than, oh, we're from Cambridge and we would do poetry like Shakespeare forever. No, we just wanted to things that would always be different, and that's what we're about, really. Always about well, you know, been playing every experimentation, and you know, we've done yeah. theatre and music, and you know, we're you know, that's what we're about, and that's what we always continue to be. In. And I, you know, about people giving me bad reviews, but I love it because that means I'm hitting the raw nerve and it's fucking them off, and I'm happy with that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you, everyone who shared your beautiful poetry and storytelling and thank music. Thank you for having us and for yeah. being part of it as well. It was yeah. really wonderful to hear all your work. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. everybody's great tonight. And we have about 50 people with Facebook and Zoom, so that's not a bad number. So that's, that's pretty that's, good. That's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. So, yeah. For, for, especially for a Zoom. Yeah, Very good. Yeah. Well, probably more people than we normally have at our gigs, Pete. So well, when we do our live gigs, <laughs> when we do our live gigs, here's a little thing. We we used to our live gigs in the past have got up to hundred people come along. But when we used to do call for you, Gabby used to kill me because with this little calf call for you, you know what I mean, on the Union Street. And mm -hmm. I just think that ah, come in, come in. At one point, we had seventy-five people in a tiny space, and it's like and Matt and um, who's he called? Uh, the guy, the chef guy there. What's he called? Um, uh, Matt was like, and, and Gabby went, Oh, is this safe? He went, Probably not. Yeah, I think we, yeah, so we jam packed it with 75. I got told off so many times by Gabby by that. I said, No, it's all right. Just let him in. Just let him in. Let me in. Uh, I've just had a message from Andy Wave Barnett. He says, Happy faces and peace and love, everyone. Thank you, Andy. Um, he's someone that I used to know when I lived up in Whitley. So, hello, Andy. I'm really glad you could take a peek and have a look at what we do. 
So <laughs> yeah, it's been a fab evening. I really enjoyed it. I mean, I love I love people's creativity anyway. I always do. I'm, Everything I live for is for art. So and you're all great artists and wonderful and beautiful people. Yeah, I'm liking your, uh, Sean, I'm liking your Japanese style kimono uh, dressing. Not <laughs> 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 Douglas on us or something then, a bit of sort of karate thing going on. <laughs> I'm falling apart a bit and I thought this is a bit revealing. Yeah, go, yeah. On, go on, Sean, open up a little bit, open up a bit. Oh, <laughs> This would be a new experimental version. Yeah. Of... <laughs> Come on, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this has been great. Thank you so much for letting me join your Zoom because I was unsure. Oh, sure man, it's been lovely to have you. Oh, yeah. Lovely to have you. Both of you. Both of you. Wonderful people. Thank you both. Yeah. yeah it's lovely to see you. bacon rich chicken Thank in the kitchen you. while I've just been sitting here. Bad. That looks so much like Jesus now. Good news that Trump is leaving as well. Good news about Trump going. So yeah. If only oh. we can get rid of Boris here, we'll be happy. I know, I know. Let me know if you need a hand, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, from Nor I'm from Northern Ireland, so I've got even bigger reason to get rid of that idiot. I can, yeah. say, a few more, I can say a few more words, but you know, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, Boris says he's always in touch with the people, but I can't see it personally. Yeah, he's touching them. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's probably one of those secret <laughs> pedophiles, isn't it, Boris the pedophile? Uh, <laughs> uh, philandra. She's yeah. got a message from Pip. She says, I'm quite cosy and relaxed now, so I'll stay in the background. Haha, <laughs> thanks so much for having me and odd step deployment. What a brilliant way to end the gig. I felt both overwhelmed and relaxed at the same time. Haha, <laughs> it was brilliant. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yes, that's good. Overwhelming and relaxing. That's, that's just... That's right, perfect. Spot on. Spot That's on. Yeah. What I'm for. Brilliant. Okay, yeah. uh, Philippa, thank you for your wonderful work tonight. At the beginning, it was wonderful. You were fantastic. Thank writer. you so much, Slane. Thank and, you. Um, we hope to, when this all ends, come and visit Wonder Zoo. We'd we'll be happy to do something with you to work alongside us because I know you have an interest. We would be interested as well. Yeah, that'd be amazing. I recently actually. Um, uh i have good news i actually i i secured a job um really? yes yeah so i'm super happy that i've got some employment until about july and um yeah i'm be able to work around that and sort of do some of the things that i enjoy as well because home working has actually been really nice so <laughs> yeah cool. oh, be really good. excited to get involved yeah it'd be great to have you come and hang out with us at some point yeah lovely. Def definitely, yes, definitely. You in the camp for you to do something with us for definitely yeah <laughs> i look forward to it I miss Lydon, my doll says she loves you, so <laughs> yeah, my doll's like you, that's a good sign. They hate Gabby, they really hate Gabby. <laughs> I mean, she buried Miss Lydon in the sand. It's not right, is it? A head in the sand. I was wondering, I was wondering why she was missing a bit of, uh, he was missing a bit of paint on his head. <laughs> yeah quite an old doll isn't it found it somewhere yeah, yeah. well the, the story is that me and gabby used to help run flameworks many many moons ago and we did this film night there and i wanted to piss off the audience so i put i lined up the first chairs with all these broken dolls as the vip guests and people were getting annoyed because they couldn't sit in the front and i said well it's not my fault the dolls there is it and i'd love to <laughs> round them up <laughs> oh, that's brilliant <laughs> Oh. I always like a little bit of a fun wind up it that way. That's the best way to be. Uh, sometimes in the arts, everyone gets a bit too serious, and I'm like, oh, fuck that. I mean, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, if anyone's uh, free tomorrow night, me and Slane are going to be doing a radio show on P Town Radio from 7 till 10. So we'll be going live on the internet from 7 till 10, doing a lot of we've got three interviews and lots of eclectic music from Slane's private collection so basically it's world music reggae and uh, blues and jazz mainly so yeah so if you've got right. if you haven't got anything to do and you just wanted to hear some music and some chat and interviews and stuff just um tune in to ptownradio.co.uk yeah <laughs> yeah oh, i've got oh. to admit the the dressing gown is is super cool I mean, if you want to nip it up in a bit, go ahead. 
Great pattern. Let's check out the pattern. Oh, don't. I, I, I have to go into the corner. Oh, I'm back out. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah. Anyone got anything, final words before we go? This is the floor. So, no. well. just so amazing it is to see people's faces, especially yeah. yours, Maria. And especially yours, Lucy. Oh, oh. 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 So fantastic to see you. Sana, we haven't said hello to you yet. Hi, Sana. Oh, yeah, Sana. Everyone say hello. Hi, Sana. Hi. Sana. Hi. 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 Great to have you with us. Um, and, and James, um, I really always dig your work, mate. I really do. Thanks for the book and the post as well from your poetry. You're thank one of you. my favourite poets. Ooh, thank you very much. And um, so kind. And I've, I look I've got nothing to like... say, but I've got this noise to make. <laughs> <laughs> and when, when, when we can get back to Exeter Phoenix gigs, I should be over there. I was going to play last month for next, well, before last month, but unfortunately we couldn't have everything. So, yeah. which is just a shame. But I will hopefully be back in Exeter Phoenix at some point. <laughs> and uh, if not, taking the mics on Mondays at Tim's, that's Tim King's drop in as sessions for writers. And that's brilliant. Yeah, I like taking the mics. You never know quite what you're going to get there. No, not no, not at all, really. And I like the idea. I like the the word. I like. The, what he's called it, a dro uh, the weekly drop-in, because it's yeah, something yeah. kind of that immediately takes away your nerves. You, you you don't feel nervous when you're just dropping in, so that's all right. Wow. You know, it's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. You're not you're not sort of sacrificing something forever. It's it's <laughs> it's, it's nice. I like that. And final words from Chi and Slain. Oh, hello everyone. We must go now. Good night, everyone. Good night. 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 Good night.